Hello, everybody. My name is Lottie Leeming. Welcome to Livycast Series 3, the official podcast for the Leeds International Festival of Ideas, brought to you by Chapter 81 Productions. Now, in this episode, we're asking if Brexit is destroying the live music industry, with many musicians and crew saying it's now a costly and confusing nightmare to tour in Europe. So are the barriers of Brexit stopping the movement of British music? That's what we're asking. We're joined by Ellie Giles, who's the founder of Step Music Management. Ellie's been in the industry for 20 years now. That's right, Ellie, isn't it? And also a board member of the Music Managers Forum. Welcome to Livycast. We've also got on the sofa Simon Ricks, bassist in the Kaiser Chiefs, of course, and also a manager now himself, looking after Tree Boy and Arc, as well as many other artists, Great to have you both here. So if you dive straight in with Brexit, I mean, many in the industry have said that as soon as Brexit happened, it effectively brought down these barriers straight away with those soaring costs of getting visas, trucks full of equipment stuck at Dover. So Ellie, what's been your experience since Brexit? It's, it, I think from a, a management point of view, it's, it's just more paperwork. So everything has become harder and longer and you have to think about all the eventualities. So instead of previously you'd book a tour in Europe, but all you'd have to think about is withholding tax, which is a is a big issue in Europe, um, uh, where sometimes they take 30% of your fee. Um, now it's like, okay, do we need a carne, um, which is a, a goods passport. Um, so that means that if you are taking, say, uh, guitars, amps, drums, you know, a whole back line, then you need a goods passport. And that's around about 300 to 500 pounds, depending on where you get it from. Um, some, they do have discounts at certain area in certain places. Um, but yeah, it's, it, that's already a tax on top of what you would ordinarily spend on going to Europe. So orchestras, they've said, they can be spending thousands of pounds each time they go. Yeah, and the other thing is about with the carne is that you have it for a year and you have to state how many countries you're going to hit. So you say all the countries you're going to hit, even if you're not going to go there. But equally, if you've bought an extra piece of equipment over that year, you have to buy another carne. So you, it, it's the carne is very strict. Uh, you can't just add a bit of equipment onto the carne. And we've seen bands already, you know, saying they thought they had the documents, they thought they had everything they needed, and still they were stuck there at the border and, and, and couldn't get through. Yeah, so ultimately that is also to do with the way it's being processed at Dover. So um, at Dover and at, and at Calais, um, they are really taking their time to, to process things because, of course... Uh, they now have to check people's passports, which they didn't do before. Uh, or they did it one in kind of 20 or 30. Um, so now everyone has to get off the bus. They have to check the passports and go through that process, which makes everything so much longer. Um, uh, and so if you've not got the carne and ultimately you, you know, you haven't put in that time frame to make, to, to go through that processing, then ultimately you might miss your train, you might miss your ferry, and therefore you might miss your gig which has happened to, to numerous artists. Yeah, we've seen that, haven't we, that people have just said, sorry, I'm going to have to cancel this yeah. tour. You know, disappointed fans, they lose money as well. Now, Simon, you know, I'm imagining you back in the day, you know, you all jump in that van, you're going to Europe, you've got a fiver in your pocket for <laughs> the ferry and some petrol, your gear, you've got your merchandise, and then you tour Europe, you know, free and easy, building up that profile and career. I mean, is that what it was like? I might, I might be a bit rose tinted glasses, but, you know, was it quite easy and essential for you to do that, to build up your reputation? I oh, definitely it was essential. And, it, yeah, it was really, really easy. Um, we always, you always had to show your pattern. The thing about Brexit was when you said it, they all said about, like, protecting the borders and stuff, is when we went on tour to Europe, the only place you ever had to show your passport was to get back into England. Like, everyone had to go up and everyone had to show their passport to get into England. So that existed anyway, which mm -hmm. made... He's always made me think that like it's so such a pointless thing. But anyway, uh, but yeah, just getting into Europe and then just being able to do what you wanted, go in every all the countries. I think there's a limit on how many countries you can go to, or how many countries the trucks can go to. I think it's yeah, it's four or something. Yeah, like four stops. So then you know you 
if you're in a bigger band, then if you're going to do a tour of like, I don't know, 10 countries, you end up having trucks going up, up uh, in and out of England and stuff. It's bad at worst for the environment. But going back to, yeah, back to the beginning, I just think, yeah, it was very, very important. And it's very hard to make money. You know, there's like big distances to travel, you know, and vans to hire and hotels and all that stuff. It's very expensive anyway. Um, and you're sort of doing it as a lost lead maybe anyway to just try and become successful in as many countries as possible for, you know, speculate to accumulate and all that stuff. But I think it definitely puts some people off going to Europe. Like, although I think um, my experience with like the bands I manage is that European like festivals and stuff, I mean, first of all, I think they look after artists really well. Like they'll pay for hotel rooms and pay for food and stuff things like that and pay nice fees better than in the UK, I think. But um, for the bands themselves, just the, my people I look after are pretty uh, on it and like they want to get it all right and everything. But even when they've got the carne, one of my bands, then there was another number that you have to get, which is the number. Every time you use the carne, you have to apply for, to get this number that I've forgotten the name of. So they didn't know about that. And then they found out about that. So they got that. And then they still got to Dover the second time they'd used it. So they went out and they came back. They went to go out again. The person that was like, oh, you need this bit of paper. And they were like, oh, the person at Calais took it. Yeah. And they were just at this standoff of... Sounds like a nightmare. So it's like... um. Uh... The best way to describe it is different coloured pieces of paper on a carne. And so each, so at certain points you have to get it stamped. So say if you're going into a border, uh, say if you're crossing the border between Sweden and Norway, say, it might be at that border they don't have somewhere that you can stamp that, that carne. So then you have to drive to a port to go and stamp that carne. So there are certain places where you can get that that carne stamped. And if you don't get it stamped in that country and then you come back to the UK and they see you haven't got it stamped, then you're you could get your equipment taken off you. So it's 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 all these little things as well as um that it you know, as much as it's like, oh we'll just get the carne. Well no, actually you then have to think about the logistics of using that carne and what that looks like. I had a an, a band many years ago and we got a carne and they had traveled from Sweden to Norway and because Norway at the time we needed carnes. So Norway and Switzerland were always, you always needed carnes before uh, Brexit because they were out of the EU, the EU block as such. And, uh, and they got in, they were like, got nowhere we can stamp this. So then they had to travel to the port in Norway. <laughs> And meanwhile, they're thinking you need to be on stage yeah. in like just a few so, hours. So it's just, yeah. So it's just all of them little things that you don't even think of. And I think a lot of managers and a lot of, you know, a lot of tour managers who've gone through Norway and gone through Switzerland, gone through Canada and America will have gone through that process. But there's some younger tour managers that have never gone through that process and never seen that. And so ultimately it's a whole new education as well. Um, so it's like a whole new book that you have to read rather than, um, you know, before it was like, oh, it's a little page. Yeah, it's fine. It's cool. We'll book the shows, go out there. And then also you have to now <laughs> harangue promoters to be like, can we use your backline? Because now you start thinking, well, maybe we just use the backline and we fly in with very limited stuff, especially smaller, newer artists. Because so you're using stuff already out there yeah. rather than taking it yourself. Exactly. And then you can save getting a carne. So, but then, Ellie, is that again losing jobs for people from, you know, the UK because you're just going to use people with the EU passport who are already in the country, aren't you, already in Europe? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, I've got a post-classical artist called Erlen Cooper that I manage and, you know, we use players in Europe. Um, when he goes over there because it's cheaper and more cost effective. And then ultimately with tour, tour managers as well and like uh, session musicians or backline um, tech, um, you know, especially with a, a, a sizable operation like Kaiser Chiefs, um, you'd have to be make sure that then people can work in Europe um, because they might have used their 90 days in the 180 days. That's another thing, isn't it? That yeah. you're, you're limited yeah. how much time you can spend there yeah. as well. So we know people who've said, I'm sorry, I can't take that contract because I've used up all my days. 100%. There was, uh, I think it was 
was Anastasia or Shakira's drummer who had played 90 days already in Europe and then got asked to go and play with Shakira or Anastasia. I can't remember who. And, uh, and he couldn't do it because he, he'd used his days. And there's not a visa you can go and apply for to go and get the extens extension on them days. You can apply for visas in each of the countries, but not within Europe. That's right. It was the drummer. He'd worked with Anastasia yep. and now basically, you know, told an all-party committee, I'm now on universal credit. I've lost a career for, what, 20, 30 years. So, Simon, we can look now and think, hang on a minute, how did the government make this happen? Why didn't they negotiate freedom of movement? Because it's worth billions, isn't it, this industry? It's exported around the world. It, it's quite hard to fathom, really. <laughs> That's not a question for me, I don't think. I mean, I was 100% anti-Brexit and like the whole thing seemed crazy and like yeah if we were doing it some sort of softer version with freedom of movement or whatever but there's you know just the certain people in certain parties were found it unacceptable or whatever but I think there's another thing which we, to, uh, is about bands coming here from elsewhere so my friend actually is on tour at the moment with an American band so because they really wanted him to do the tour manage the tour so he did it he's hired gear in England, got Carney for it, driven to Berlin to meet them where they're coming from America. They've got gear with them. So then he's got to have a second Carney for the stuff they bought, guitars and stuff that personal items they bought with them because they're doing Europe and then they're coming back into England and then going back out to Ireland. So they've got to do all that again. And then they think they fly out from Ireland and he comes back to, but like in the past, that was just, that's fine. You can go in and out of all those places and kind of do what, do whatever you want. And now that, for him, it was like them doing that. He was like, don't take me because if you take me because he's going to come from England and all that stuff, uh, you're not going to make any money. But they were very kindly. They really wanted to take him. So that was good. But um, in a lot of cases, you could see them just getting a, a German tour manager or whatever as it's easier. Well, we saw Trigger Cut, didn't we, German band, and they went viral because they were there at Calais and told, no, you're told you've not got this certificate, um, you're going to have to go back. So they were devastated. They said they were humiliated, and that was it. They cancelled that tour in the UK, and they've said, we're probably not going to come back. I mean, that's awful, isn't it? Yeah, it's it, it's just, um, it, it's like, and the thing is, a lot of the border guards, they don't have the education so, you know, you, you'll meet one border guard and they'll say one thing and you'll meet another border guard and they'll say another thing. Um, so it's not like the, the, the information is trickling down to the right people. Um, so as much as the government have created all these rules, actually a lot of the border guards don't understand the rules. Um, so it, it's just like it's so backwards. Uh, it's like the left hand is definitely not speaking to the right hand. It feels like a self-inflicted wound, doesn't it, Simon? We shot ourselves in four. I liked the first time we went to Europe and came back. We went to Belgium and then we came back through Calais and it was like the properly like a sort of uh, analogy of Brexit. And we went in the French side and we had to take our bags off the bus and stuff, which was a new thing. So we took our bags off. And it was all slick and quiet because it's like four in the morning or whatever, putting our bags through the thing. Everything was calm and serene. And then we hit the British side and it was like there's this massive pile of rubbish first of all, and then just queues and like people everywhere and border guards walking in and out and around and like just seemed like no one knew what was going on. You know, you're, in, you're kind of in a queue, but you don't know whose go it is next sort of thing. And it just was absolute, just a mess. Just we're there for like, we weren't there for that long, maybe like 45 minutes or an hour, as opposed to it used to be about 10 minutes. Um, but it just, the fact that it just felt like chaos and that was four in the morning, you know what I mean? At, I presume at 10 in the morning. When there's more people coming through, it's just unbelievable. Ellie, will that put people off? I think if you've got a big label behind you, you're established, you can sort it out probably, can't you, and allow time and there's someone to fill out the paperwork and that sort of thing. But if you're up and coming and you're not established yet and you want to go to Europe to make your name, it's not good, is it? 100%, 100%. And that's why um, the MMF and uh, UK Music have been calling for a... Um, a, a, a kind of uh, like an export office, uh, and uh, and I think ultimately that would help because ult Norway have export office, Germany have export office, Iceland has an export office, um, and what that export office would do is is help to 
to make everything a little bit more fluid so that you can export a lot quicker and a lot easier. Um, and it's something I think we really need in this country. Um, but yeah, ultimately, when you're making that decision, you have to work out how much you're losing. Can you try and mitigate them costs by either asking, you know, the promoter to, to, to provide backline or, um, you know, or to find different ways to, to, to manage it? Um, you know, go without a tour manager, go without a sound engineer. Um, uh, so make it as very a minimum setup as possible um, just to make it work. And, and equally, that's still not sometimes possible because the, the money lost a lot of the time can be, you know, to do a European tour when you first start can be thousands, like thousands of pounds of money that you are going to lose um, because of, you know, as, as Simon rightly said, the distances are insane. You, you know, you, you're not thinking about like driving from, you know, Leeds to London. It's, 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 you know, there's some of them are like 10 hour, 12 hour trips. Uh, so, you know, that you've got the petrol and all of that to consider. So yeah, it's, it, it just, it just, we just need the government to really start considering business a little bit more we always you know you the conservatives have always said that they're very pro-business but i don't see that right now i see a very uh uh you know unlogical and a non-business like um uh a party and it doesn't make any sense to me because you're not allowing for business to grow yeah it doesn't seem like a priority does it we know that um more than 200 artists they've launched a campaign called let the music move um argued that restrictions could lead to the collapse of the industry simon i mean what what do we need to do that do they need to sort out this visa situation pretty quickly well i think it's like for smaller artists it means there's a, there's a part of you just like well we just won't bother mm -hmm. do it like illegally or whatever see what happens so there's that part I think it's like the like a medium sized artist where basically you know like if you sort of like Kaisers would do well in the UK so you do that tour and you do a few festivals in the UK but then that gives you probably like eleven months of the year to do other stuff and if there's nowhere else to go because like it's just a little bit expensive to go to Europe or it's always been quite expensive to go to America or whatever then you're sort of stuck and then for certain artists you know if you're not making enough money out of maybe the UK stuff then suddenly you can't, you know, those little bits of top up from elsewhere were maybe doing it, were helping. So suddenly you've not got, you can't do it. You know, it's not cost effective and you've got to go get a different job. That's, it's sort of, yeah, I just, I think it could just ruin the music industry pretty quickly, really, or the touring industry at least. Because ultimately the way you build a business for an artist is about building uh, the kind of the structure and the basement of the of the house as such, uh, and and you and you put that in, and and ultimately that is, you know, if you have the money and you have the resources, ideally that's getting into Europe quite quickly, um, because ultimately what you want is to have um, a good business in different many in many different markets, um, not just one market, because if you've got it in many different markets then you have a sustainable business. Um, unless of course you've got an artist that is very big here and you know, it might not be as big elsewhere, but equally, it, you know, it can, it can sustain, um, in one market, but ultimately that's what you want to do. And, and I think, you know, and, and the, the, you know, the bands like Muse, they went out very early days when they first started into Europe and did that. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing is as well that, uh, with visas, it's, you know, this 90 day rule. So you, you normally have a tour manager that you have for years, a lot of the time. Um, and so ultimately that tour manager might be hitting that 90 days. The artist might be hitting that 90 days. And then what do you do? You know, it's, it's, it, cause, cause sometimes you'll go round and round and, you know, go and do, I don't know, four or five shows in each country around Europe, if you're at a certain level. Um, so yeah, you know, it, it's just needs that the red tape just needs to be cut. It really needs to be cut and it needs to be considered a little bit more fair. You can do, a, if they want to keep that and they want to do a visa, just make it very simple to apply for a visa that you can get an extension on that 90 days for the, for the whole of Europe and pay 50 quid. Because you know as well, like, it's about how it's ad admin is definitely a part of it. So my friend goes in and out quite a lot. 
And the way they count United days is they count the pay, they count the stamps. So he went, like when he first like started going in and out quite a lot, it was like fine. But now he's like on like eighty eight days. They're like they're going like one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And like it's just a massive queue yeah. behind him. There's no electronic system saying how many days he's been in. It's just literally counting his dates. It's absolutely that explains insane. those cues then, doesn't it? Yeah, they they are going to bring in uh, biometrics in January, and so that will change everything in regards to they will be able to know how many days you've been uh, in that country, and so they will be able to kind of yeah manage manage it from their side much better. But equally, from uh you know from our side as 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 managers and you know artists um, and tour managers, I think it's going to be, you know, you, you can't kind of just go, oh, well, I'll slide in an extra day here, you know. As... Yeah, there's no spontaneity. Let's <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> no let's talk merchandise as a big music fan. I love the merch, the T-shirts, the tea towels, loving the tea towel <laughs> movement. But you're able just to chuck that, I guess, into the truck or the van and make money on that essential part of the tour. But now that's costing more, isn't it? Or you might get it made in... Europe and, and pick it up there. So again, losing money in the yeah. UK. Yeah. So um, they also ask where it's originated, where the uh, like material is originated. So if that T-shirt has been made in China, you have to mention that it's been made in China. Um, they want to know, yeah, where it's made uh, before you ship it into Europe. Um, and then you've got tax issues as well, which there wasn't tax issues before. Um, so ultimately, from my point of view, we do not, at the moment, I'm really not doing merch unless it's a big, if I had an artist that was a big merch band, then I would do it, but I would buy it in Europe and I would, uh, I would pick it up in Europe. I certainly would not be bringing it from the UK. So again, Simon, the odds are just stacked against, you know, someone who hasn't got a lot of money or a big label behind them, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's that was often the smaller bands. I think that merch is the thing that makes the tour work. Like that's the pace for the petrol or whatever. So I think, yeah, when we used to go to Switzerland, because it was a pain to do the merch in and out of Switzerland, you sort of just wouldn't sell any in Switzerland because just to make that sort of... Because of carnage. ...a bit yeah. easier in the past, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I could see that a lot of people would just not bother because it's just complicated and like it's hard like i think people think it's quite easy but it's very hard like making money out of music and like you know t even with t-shirts where we have some t-shirts in the uk by the time you've like got them made and paid the venue they're like 25 percent and all that other stuff and uh, moved them about there's very little profit left so just to sort of have another bit of that cut off you like whatever withholding tax or whatever it just it just makes it, yeah, like you say, we won't bother. Again, making it all very small. I mean, we're on a small island, is it? It is. You know, Europe was a great place, wasn't it, to establish you, then go to America. Um, but we voted for Brexit, didn't we? So have we just, we made our bed, Simon? Huh. We've got to line it, haven't we? We've just got to make it work. We've just got to adapt to these new rules. And, and yeah, we can adapt, I think. But ultimately, the government need to bring an export office in. Um, and they need to, if they want to keep with these rules and they want to stick with them, then ultimately, you know, stick, give an opportunity to be able to get extension on your 90 days um, across the Schengen area and ultimately give us an export office. Now, the government has said in a statement that it's supporting the UK's brilliant musicians uh, to adapt to the new arrangements, make touring easier. Doesn't sound like that's happening very quickly. It, it, there's there's words and there's action, and action needs to happen. An action is not happening. An action is something that we require. Um, at the end of the day, you know, with uh, streaming, it's so much harder as a band to make money because ultimately, it's you don't make as much money as what you do from ba people buying a record or a CD. So please buy records and CDs. Um, uh, so yeah, you know, and what you would usually make your money from was touring and merchandise. Um, so yeah, it's just like, you know, you're just, you're taking from people at every single point and it's just very naive. So Simon, imagine when you started, um, you know, if you'd just been able to tour in the UK in pubs, clubs, venues, I mean, it might've been a very different story, might it? 
I got loads more sleep, I guess. <laughs> that would have been good. But uh, yeah, I mean, we, when we first started our first year, it was absolutely insane. And we were going to, went to America uh, eight times and went all over Europe and Australia and everywhere else. Went all over the world all the time. And like, that was the thing, really. That big push in those first couple of years is the thing that's made us still successful now. You know, like, it's all, I think that initial push is so, so important. So yeah, if you're like stopping people doing that, then I think it will affect, it affects long, long term career. And I think like with the government thing, it's like, I think there's other things, you know, there's other things like the Northern Ireland stuff that's like probably more important, but it just shows a lack of foresight of like anything. And then once Brexit was through, the people who sort of, you know, blew the flag for it, were a bit like, okay, cool. There's all these problems, but you guys, like you musicians can sort these musician problems out. Um, it just feels a bit like they just, we need a bit more help and responsibility but from them to sort of make sure that it doesn't uh, ruin like a really good thing a really good economy and something that brings i always used to say like with kaisers when we used to go to like we go out of the country like go to germany we do a festival and we bring in money like we're just in like importing money to the uk that's all we're doing and we're paying our tax and like what there isn't a better industry i don't think than that like everyone else like if you sell products and stuff there's still product like literally musicians just go and bring back money it's like we're like um People in the 15th century going to New Islands and, you know, whatever, I don't know. But that British music does that, doesn't it? We are known internationally for our music and have been for decades. Is the worry that we're going to be, go backwards, as you say, and be some, like, cultural backwater when it comes to music? Because we don't have the, you know... Well, you, you know, you look at artists from Iceland and Norway and Sweden and they're playing more shows internationally than UK artists. If you actually look at the numbers... And we actually did the, I, I haven't looked at the, you know, proper data on it. And we should look at the data on it because I think it would be very good to do the data on it. They all have export offices and they, and all of them tour considerably much more than we do. And why is that? Like, like, because I think we think there's an arrogance in this country of like, well, we're the greatest country. You know, we don't need that. No, we do. We do need that. You know, at the end of the day, back in the day, it was very easy. You just get in a van, you head over there, and it was, you know, petrol wasn't as expensive. Hotels you could probably make work. You could just make it work and maybe lose, I don't know, 500 quid, right? And I I saw, you know, 10 years ago, I would have done a tour budget and been like, oh, we're going to lose 500 quid. We can probably do that in Europe. Now it's like thousands. That, that's, you know what I mean? That's the discrepancy now. It's, it's, a, it's a massive difference. So, so I, I think, yeah, we, you know, a lot of the other country, our artists from the other countries are going to get, be in front of us. And that is not good enough. And so hard work for someone from like a marginalised community or disadvantaged background as well. I mean, how are they going to get a step on the ladder in this industry, Simon? I mean, it's, it's fairly hard anyway, I think, even in the UK. But, yeah, it's sort of impossible. Like, it just makes it a thing where you have to have money, basically, to do creative stuff, which is not what we want, is it? Because that's not how it's meant to work. We love music. We love going to gigs. It feels like creativity and artistic industries are always getting battered, doesn't it? But the facts show this makes billions, this industry, doesn't it? It's it's an in, insane business. It's, you know, from a purely numbers point of view, the amount of money that comes into this country, um, it's bigger than, than fishing. It is. So <laughs> everyone, it's bigger than fishing. The MPs might not think it is, but it is. And, and um, you know, creative industries is a, is a massive part of GDP. It's a massive part. Well, so, we're the second largest export of music after the US, aren't we? Yeah. Can we sustain that if we're not able to move around Europe? I would say that the data is going to start showing that that is going to go down. Uh, certainly from a touring perspective, yes. And the other thing that, you, you know, that people don't realise and people should realise is that a lot of the time, you know, you can go to a label and you say, I want to go and break that market. And they were like, it's a chicken and egg situation. Um, they will say, you have to be in market. So you have to go to be in that market to go and get the press moving and the radio moving and everything. You know, you can't just go and get the press and radio moving without being in market. Just not how it works. So ultimately, you could say, oh, right, well, I'm going to go and help break Europe and not tour. 
that doesn't work. So therefore, it's actually going to impact record sales and streaming and all of that, as well as the touring, because it's actually a chicken and egg. And I think that actually that narrative hasn't actually been talked about enough, um, is that actually I don't think the the record labels have, and BPI and, and AIM have actually kind of cottoned onto that yet, that actually to break an artist in in a in another country you have to be in market from a, a on a purely you know live level so i mean even sir elton john has spoken about this he has said you know he's stopping touring though isn't he maybe that's maybe it's so right, fine, yeah, but... yeah. <laughs> but i think he's looked you know seen those cues at dover and he said to this all um party parliamentary group on music you know he said that ridiculous we've got such a vibrant industry or had one um you know what is the future do you think can we pull this back if you know already had COVID, which put us out of action for a couple of years? So what can be done, you know, as you look at your bands and artists that you manage? Um, I think it's difficult. I think like I'd, I like to be quite, you know, positive about things. And I always think that it it will work itself out, I think, because it kind of has to. And like I went to South by Southwest this year and they just have a, a waiver for if you're doing that that conference, you can just go in as a band. Actually, it was the easiest I've ever got into America. Um, so you just, they just need to develop a system where, you know, there's a form you can fill out if you're a band or maybe under a certain amount of uh, profit on your tour or, you know, that you just get waved through or whatever, just have some sensible rules, but it's just in this time where we're not making those things that everyone's in kind of in limbo and like, who's gonna, maybe if there's a change of government or whatever, who's going to actually stand up for the musicians and get those, you know, get that sort of sensible legislation through. That's the thing. Yeah. And there have been calls for a touring czar in the government to particularly look at this, unravel all that red tape. So shall we be hopeful, Ali? Shall we think that this is just a bit of a blip because it's a new thing we're all dealing with, but there'll be hope and we'll be able to move again. The way to change government's mind is data actually, uh, ultimately and information. And so, you know, we do a call out from the MMF, um, where we ask for case studies of situations that have caused issues to uh, musicians uh, and, and red tape. And we still need case studies to, and, and what that does is that's pure data. And we can take that to government and actually use that as a way to explain to them that there is a reason why we need to change this. And I think that ultimately, as long as we keep lobbying and we keep explaining why and keep making people see why, then I think we can change it. I do genuinely believe that. Let's hope we can move again in Europe. So as well as music, I've got to mention football as one of our great British exports because I've got you both here on the Liffey House sofa. Leeds and Liverpool, is that right, Ali? So, oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> Together without a quick talk about how you're doing. Simon. <laughs> How are you feeling as a Leeds fan at the moment? Uh, as I say, I'm quite a positive person. And so I do a, pos I do a podcast and we've sort of done lots of chat and uh, we were all pretty positive we're going to stay up. I think the last week or so has been a bit of a blow to that, but I'm, I'm still pretty hopeful that there's, there's some really bad teams and Leeds are one of them, but I don't think we're the worst. LA? Yeah, we've had a pretty uh, mixed season to say the least, uh, but... Uh, Klopp in the last two games has changed uh, the way he is positioning people and um, and I, I think it's shown in the Arsenal game and the Leeds game that we potentially can try and get a bit of maybe European football, maybe not Champions League football, but certainly European football. So I'd be over the moon if we can get European football. Um, we had such a successful season the season before, so you know, we, we nearly won a quadruple, you know, and that's that's unheard of. So it's, um, yeah, you know, you, you're going to have uh, years where you're rebuilding and and you just, you know, you just got to hope that the next season will be much better. You're both so positive. I won't mention that I'm from Burnley. Uh, just <laughs> oh, I like that's company. Good. I think he's a great manager. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. And Simon, before we finish our chat, like, you know, you are positive, feeling hopeful. Do you imagine if there are young artists, bands, or just independent, you know, people without that big backing of wealth and labels, what sort of advice would you have, have for them? They might be feeling demoralised at the moment because, you know, they're not getting the work in Europe. What would you say to them? I would just say that 
it's just got to keep keep trying and keep I mean, for me it's like being in a band is you know it's quite attritional at times but you've just got to keep uh writing good songs and doing like doing good gigs and stuff i mean i do think there's this like sorry to just, like change the subject but i think there is a like a growing number of artists who just don't tour and like perhaps this is because it's like hard and it's expensive and i think there's a growing number of like solo artists as well as opposed to bands because like it's expensive to get all your gear, you know, and get a hire a van and do all that stuff, you know. Whereas if you can just jump in a car and go and do your gigs and with backing track or whatever, or indeed I'll say just sit at home and write songs and just try and gradually add up the Spotify streams until you can sort of make a reasonable living out of it. There's like other ways, but for me, just that um, I don't know, I love it, that joy of sort of going and doing a gig with your, your you know, group of friends or whatever is like one of the best things going. So um, if we can encourage people more, you know, back into doing that, make it easier to do that, then that's that's good. Yeah, it looks a lot of fun being on tour. There are funds out there. And, and I think that's the other thing is like, you know, don't be scared of applying for funds. PRS have a great fund, uh, have numerous- Who's that, Ellie? Uh, PRS, uh, the, um, it's the, uh, they collect uh, on behalf of writers. Uh, um, in the UK, uh, so if you get played on radio, half of the money goes to the master side, which is your recorded side, and half goes to your publishing side, which is your writer side, uh, and they collect half of that, PRS collect half of that money, uh, well, collect all of that money and then pay half out to the pub. Anyway, I'm going into a business. <laughs> it's yeah. confusing, though, isn't so it? It's very confusing. It's a good description. It's it's very difficult. Difficult. Try and get some money. Yeah. And yeah. So, so I guess my point being is that there are different funds out there. Um, there's a Yorkshire PRS fund for up and coming artists that you can apply for. Um, and uh, there are Centric, uh, who are a publishing company. If you sign up to them, they also can offer you a thousand pounds for touring um uh so there are many different ways um there's the youth music fund as well um there's arts council depending on what kind of music you're making um uh so yeah there's there's always hope um and i think it's just doing the the education and the knowledge and you know finding people who have that knowledge maybe on social media and following them or you know um and just doing some research but there are there is po pockets of money, and if you're writing great music, you, the chances of you getting that money pretty high. So people just need to keep going, don't they? Have hope, and you know, reach out to established people and just say, you know, hang on a minute, I can't fill this form in, or I don't know about yeah. this. Ask for help and and keep going. Get mentors, like get people who have that education and that knowledge, um, that was, might be able to help you. I think it's more than that ever as well. Like when I think when we started. We didn't get any mentoring or any funding or anything. There just wasn't. I think it did, well, there was a bit of it, but it wasn't well publicised, and we did, we certainly didn't know about it. And now I think there's absolutely tons of great organisations. Like in every region, there's a regional one and there's lots of national ones. So yeah, there's definitely loads of people you can ask for help for free. So we're hopeful, Simon, that we will continue to have these fantastic British bands heard around the world, Europe and US. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, I think the US are about to make it more difficult as well by um, making it more expensive to get a visa to go there. So that's another thing that we would need the government to stand up for musicians for. I'm not quite sure what the US is gaining from that, but um, but yeah, it just seems to get incrementally different. Uh, so incrementally more difficult. So I think that's why we just need government people and everybody to just get behind the artists as much as possible. And Ellie, you are so hopeful then that, you know, we will sort this out, unravel that red tape, if not cut it off. I think we all just have to work together. Like the whole of the industry has to work together as a collective voice to make change with the government. Um, and if we do that, like we did at COVID, then we can make anything happen. I genuinely believe that. And, you know, if, if, if you're an artist and you're thinking, oh, well, I can't do anything. Actually, if you're at a certain level, your voice is, is, is important. Like it's hugely important. And you can add weight to a campaign um, and you can post about it on your socials and you can, you can really help change things. Um, so, you know, I always say, you know, if, if, you, if, you're, if you want to help, you know, please do. You know, do contact the Featured Artists Coalition or the Mu Musicians Union um, and they would happily take, you know, help and, uh, and, and your support. Let's keep the music moving then.
Simon, Ellie, thank you so much for joining us on LiffyCast. Thank you.